So my name is um, Anando, and I've always introduced already introduced myself. So I'll just focus on what the talk's uh, about. And uh, I'm building on the great uh, work done my, by my colleagues. Um, what this paper is about is I'll be summarizing some of my research on COVID-19. And just to give you, um, just to give you an idea of what the talk's about. Well, what's the problem statement? So the problem statement is that we as a society were unprepared for COVID-19 um, in terms of data collection and sharing protocols. And this is something which has been emphasized over and over again. This is despite the occurrence of SARS in 2003 and H1N1 in 2009. So we did not have uniform data collection and reporting protocols between providers. Now, of course, this is not uh, too dissimilar to many countries, but we had enough warning signals. And there are plenty of reports which came along from the Auditor General of Canada. And we do now know that if we had better data sharing protocols, we could have saved more lives. That we know for sure. And I think the biggest symptom of the failure is that at a time when the country needed quick data, uniform data, it was left to one graduate student from the University of Toronto to set up a GitHub on data on COVID cases and deaths across the country. And that became kind of our gold standard. So given that background, it's really reassuring to see recent policy moves where the federal government and the provinces have, are coming together to discuss uh, better data protocols and sharing. And so from that perspective, uh, what I wanna do in this talk is demonstrate that if we had better data, if we have real-time data, what are the sim some of the simple models we can use, some of which are AI-based, and what insights can you extract with those models from the data? So that is one uh, objective of my talk. Now, but I see the main um, focus of my talk on data literacy, data skills and data literacy. So I'm really building on the key recommendations of the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy Advisory Group, okay? Because the message is that we can do whatever fancy analytics we want with you know incredible results made feasible by ai and you know in some cases it's easy to do but at the end of the day if you don't have a population with relatively high levels of data skills and data literacy then nothing's going to happen because no one's going to buy into your results right it, that that's the really big uh, obstacle out there and what is the best example? Kind of one example is the controversy we had about the Public Health Agency of Canada using TELUS mobility data. Well, they did that, but the data were aggregated. Now, some of my colleagues would say even that's an issue and that's fair, but the sensationalism which occurred saying that the government has 30 million individual records of cell phones I mean, that just showed a real lack of knowledge of the type of data being employed and what can be done with what types of data. And that came from the press, from our best newspapers, right? The other point about data literacy and understanding data is it's at the heart of science, right? We, we live in a society rife with fake news and misconceptions where people go to the internet for guidance, right? And so my argument is that we need to um, work on data skills, not only to improve individual productivity, say at the workplace, but also to address misconceptions which come up in mistrust and distrust, because this is what we see also on uh, policies like mask wearing, which has become extremely contentious. Okay, so that's kind of what my talks about. So in terms of the organization, 
the empirical results are from two published papers of mine, uh, one in Canadian public policy and one in economic analysis and policy. And I've done it with uh, colleagues from the University of Waterloo. And the idea of these papers is to use relatively straightforward um, statistical models to understand the effects of different policy interventions on COVID cases. Because now if something happens in the future, we sort of want to be armed with the knowledge that these are the policies which worked before and these are the effects. So if you ever have lockdowns, we can be a bit more precise as opposed to let's lock everything down if, if that's possible, right? And what I find in my research is that the simplest models in statistics, linear regression models, actually work really well in looking at the effects of policies. And what's really surprising is that even in terms of forecasting, so what was missing uh, is a good forecasting model of daily cases for COVID. And this is something I've studied quite a bit. So this is where the AI and the machine learning come in, but even it's really basic AI. So when in statistics, the most common measures or the most common methods of forecasting are known as the Sarima models, when you have kind of time data over time. Um, and those models work well. Now, what I find in my research uh, for epidemiologists, they have another model, it's called the SIR model. And that model just failed in terms of forecasting. Okay, so, um, so in terms of these, in terms of my findings, they have implications from the perspective of data literacy and population buy-in of government policies. And the impact of mass mandates is a key finding given uh, the effects they can have in reducing daily COVID cases and the absence of negative economic spillovers or which shutdowns could have, okay? But the point being is that the enactment of mass mandates has also been seen contrary to the freedom of personal decisions, okay? And so the argument which I'm tr trying to make in my research is that better data literacy and understanding of data analysts analysis and anal analytics might lead to higher population acceptance, okay? So, um, and as I already alluded to, data literacy is also relevant with respect to understanding the implications of using mobility data, which I've already discussed. Now, again, what I'm trying to emphasize is that this is not, my, my research is not a justification that individual level mobility data should be made easily available, right? Protecting individual privacy should always be a critical pillar of public policy. But data literacy should also lead to a greater public understanding of how aggregated data can yield critical insights without necessarily compromising privacy. Okay, so now I can talk about the data and the methodology. So in this paper, what we did is that we looked at data uh, from April to September 2020 across the 12 largest public health units in Ontario. So we used a very simple model and you see that the dependent variable are daily cases and daily cases are a function of cases yesterday and the day before. We also have a proxy for the amount of daily tests. We also have a proxy whether or not there's a mask mandate. And when you see retail grocery parts, these are all Google data, right? So the idea, what we're trying to capture in this model is that uh, population mobility a week or eight days before had impacts on the amount of daily cases reported today, which is also a function of the amount of tests being conducted, okay? And I won't get into Google data because a lot of my, uh, quite a few of my uh, colleagues have already done that, but as they said, it's aggregated data based on Google Maps app use. Okay, so here are the trends in mobility. And this is for Ontario. And you see that um, uh, there's a huge, in the first uh, wave, there is a big spike up in terms of going to parks or staying at home. And then 
you see that slowly over time, there is an increase of mobility at retail businesses and workplaces, okay? And to give you context, these are the daily trends in Ontario. You see that these are daily cases and you had the first wave, but the real spike started coming up in December 2020 and Jan 21. And then you started having a drop down, which proved to be temporary. So these are the data I'm exploiting in my research. So now I can get to the results. So when you look at the results, what I'd like you to do is that only focus on this column. In these other columns, I'm just doing some robustness tests, seeing what's significant. So in each um, row, these numbers are out here, the marginal effects. What is the effect of the policy on daily cases? And in the parentheses are standard errors. So the stars tell you how statistically significant a result is. A result is only believable if it's uh, signif statistically significant. So three stars means it's significant at the 1%. 99 of 100 times, you will get this result. A one star, it's only 90 out of 100 times. So when you look at this column, this is kind of the most robust method of estimation. It's called instrumental variables. It's a methodology used widely by social scientists, especially economists. And what it does is that it takes into account the reverse causality between variables. So the point is that in these columns, we're assuming that daily cases are a function of policy, but policy could be a function of daily cases. As cases are going up, policies become more and more stringent to curb them. So we need a methodology to correct what's called reverse causality, okay? So this is something which social scientists do a lot of work on. So these results are interesting, but they're not reliable because they haven't been corrected for reverse causality. This column does. So what this column tells you is that on average, on a per capita basis, um, when you have a mask mandate in a public health unit, then considerably daily cases start going down, okay? And the other interesting results are in terms of the mobility variables and the retail mobility variable doesn't have the right sign. It's got a negative sign, which is saying as you have more retail mobility cases go down, we're obviously not capturing something properly, but in terms of the other mobility variables, they give intuitive uh, results that on average, when you have more people going to groceries and more people going to workplaces, daily cases do go up. Now, this is something which may seem trivial, but what I'd like to emphasize is we're merging many different data sets together, right? The daily cases are coming from the Ontario Health Data Portal. Google Mobility is coming from a completely different organization. So, you know, you're saying, well, you know, when you're combining everything, are you going to get any statistical significance? So the argument is that when you look at these correlations, I'm not saying they're causal, but when you see, look at these correlations, they're really interesting because then if I use Google mobility data or some type of mobility data, it gives me an idea of how the pandemic is spreading at one venues. And this is what we want to know as policymakers. So this is uh, the big picture. And what the mobility data is really useful for is forecasting. So the first part of the exercise is trying to understand what policies work. The second part of the exercise is use models to see if you can predict uh, COVID daily cases seven days or 14 days ahead, right? And these are models which we really didn't have running in the province all that well. So what I did with my colleagues is we partitioned the data into testing and training data. And then uh, what we did is that we trained our models from April, 2020 to September, 2020. And then we tested the models by forecasting seven days ahead for each day across these months. And the reason we did that is that a good forecasting model should be able to detect a break, okay? 
And almost any forecasting model can go with the trend, right? But what we tried to do as, in terms of research is we saw that in January 2021, you saw a steep decline uh, in daily cases. So which model was able to kind of switch and detect that break and adjust? And what we found is that the Serima model worked really well. Linear regressions didn't work too badly. But the purple one is the SIR model, which is the workers of epidemiologists, the sus uh, susceptible infected recovery model. And it just collapsed. Because what happened is that it didn't catch the break and it kept on predicting increasing daily cases, which is far removed from the truth. I know Vivek has a question. Okay. <laughs> so, conclusions. So, good, I'm still on time. Let me try to kind of give you actionable insights. So, the first recommendation, which should be obvious, is that governments at all levels did not have proper data collection, sharing availability and protocols in place, right? This has to be an immediate priority. Right? We need to be able to share data across institutions and across provinces, okay? Now, um, the other point is that when you look at controversies associated with policies or the use of data, well, masks work. There is no doubt about that, okay? It's just not my research. It's the research of many other colleagues. The other point is that Google data is, mobility data is really helpful. If we have mobility data, we can look at correlations between mobility and cases, but we can also forecast daily cases um, more accurately, okay? SIR models did not work that well. In fact, linear regression models proved um, even superior in terms of forecasts. Now, interesting insights. None of this modeling is that difficult. It is relatively straightforward, okay? The other point is that, so what is the barrier? So the barrier is that in Canada, we seem to have a risk aversion to sharing data. We go to someone for data, no, you cannot have it, okay? So yes. Absolutely, the privacy is a pillar of government policy, but what we're lacking in the country and in many other countries is a clear benefit cost test that can be used, right? That if we need to share data, can we, here's how we quantify the costs, here's how we quantify the benefits, this is how we go forward, right? And this is directly from the advisory group report that there is a privacy chill, okay? So again, the use of mobility data is a good case in point, right? Now, it's true, like I'm, I'm sure not all my colleagues agree about that, but with sophisticated ML algorithms, it's true that aggregate, aggregated data can be rolled back, especially when combined with external data, but in many cases, if you have large data samples, the risk is relatively low. Again, with the usual caveats of proper protocols. Okay? So it's not, it's never possible to have zero risk, but the question is how much is the trade off? Third recommendation improve population data literacy. Okay? And again, this is straight from the expert advisory uh, group report. Look at what other countries have done, okay? In, as noted by the report, Finland set the policy goal to educate 1% of their population on data and the basics of AI, okay? So why can't we have a free online course the way they did, right? To explain, to provide clarity uh, on how data can be protected, should be protected, but data can also be used to create beneficial outcomes for individuals. So there's no reason why in Canada we can't do the same thing. 
have a course set goals on AI, data literacy, and skills. Okay, and if you have that, then you may not waste time on conversations that, well, do masks matter? Do masks have an impact? Can I use mobility data? So then you have data skills, a top-down approach, okay? And so the point being is that we need large pool of employees who are trained in research methods. So I'm not saying that everyone in the government needs to be an AI expert, but why for certain levels of positions, if for your policy program, research analyst, you should take courses each year to learn these new skills. Why can't you set a certain target that for everyone in these job descriptions, 50% have to have some data literacy and data knowledge, okay, according to some parameters. Why can we not do that, okay? So in conclusion, in my opinion, the conversation on improving population data literacy and skills is as important as deciding our best approaches to future pandemics. They're all interconnected. And so policies that result in better data literacy might lead to an enhanced awareness of how facts evolve, but not from cherry-picked examples, but robust and well-documented evidence, okay? And such policies would be a strong platform in maintaining trust in government and ensuring society is well prepared for the next challenging phase. So since now I now end on the concept of trust, I pass it on my colleague, uh, Dr. Mayor, to talk about trust and uh, mistrust and distrust in society, which I think is a great way to end uh, this part of the conference before we move on to our government colleagues. Thank you very much.